Infinite Manifestations The Power of Stopping at Nothing by Richard Dots Table of Contents Chapter 1 Infinite Manifestations Are Your Natural State Chapter 2 The Nature of Our Manifestation Canvas Chapter 3 Beyond Manifestations Chapter 4 Developing a Moment-by-Moment -moment Awareness Chapter 5 Vibrational Incompatibility and the Windscreen of Life Chapter 6 The True Litmus Test Chapter 7 Spontaneous Manifestations are Part of Your Nature Chapter 8 The Magic of Infinite Release Chapter 9 The Basic Infinite Release Process Chapter 10 Adapting the Basic Recipe for Advanced Manifestations Chapter 11 On the Spot Release and Relief Chapter 12 The Power of Stopping at Nothing Chapter 1 Infinite Manifestations Are Your Natural State In my book Light Touch Manifestations, I showed readers how a simple thought or intention held in their consciousness had the power to create their physical reality. I also explained the crucial role which our personal belief system plays in supporting or sabotaging the creation process. In this follow-up book, I expand upon the concept of the manifestation sequence, first introduced in Light Touch Manifestations, before taking readers through a series of advanced steps that can create endless, ongoing manifestations in their daily lives. Collectively, I call this series of steps and technologies the System for Infinite Manifestations. If applied and used correctly, these teachings have the potential to create a stream of endless, ongoing manifestations in our daily lives. Instead of being the unconscious creator that you once were, you will now be able to hold a deliberate intention in your consciousness and have it manifest for you in your physical reality very quickly. While most of us are already manifesting and creating continuously in our lives, much of this creation process is done by default, unconsciously, and often used to perpetuate more lack instead of goodness. My main objective for this book is to explain how the state of spontaneous manifestations is not an exalted state reserved for the selected enlightened few, but a state that is generally accessible by anyone who is willing to do the inner work required. Neither intelligence nor worthiness is a prerequisite in doing this work. One does not need to engage in intense intellectual debate to get there, nor do we need to convince some superior being of our deservingness through backbreaking acts of devotion. What a wonderful realization that is! These, along with other spiritual truths will become increasingly clear to you as you do the work. As I have written so many times before, it does not matter where you come from or what you have achieved in the past. What matters is that you set a conscious intention from this point forward to do the inner work necessary. Yes, doing so will require some time and effort, but you will be getting the best returns for your time. Once you make up your mind to do it and go for it, the rewards you reap from this practice will stay with you forever. Once you have tasted a bit of that manifestation freedom and success, the experience will stay with you forever. You would have been transformed on the inside. More importantly, the know-hows and realizations gained from the process can never be taken away from you. Many years ago, I was faced with one lax situation after another despite my faithful application of these manifestation teachings. I was on the verge of giving up for good and even walked away from these teachings several times in anger, disappointment, and frustration. Back then, I blamed everything for my lack of results. I blamed the universe for not being kinder to me and also the teachers for not teaching the truth. I thought there was some ancient secret that was somehow withheld from me, or that an intermediary of some kind was needed before I could communicate with the universe. It wasn't until I was in dire straits that I was forced to take a good look at myself, at what was really happening on the inside. I reasoned that since I had already read all the major classical and contemporary books on related subjects, my lack of knowledge probably wasn't a reason for the lack of results in my life. 
This realization relaxed and soothed me a little as the burden was lifted off my shoulder for the first time in years. I already know everything I need to know, I told myself. For the first time in life, I stopped berating myself for not trying hard enough or for not doing more. I realized I had already acquired all the physical knowledge there was to be acquired. Once that first realization was made, I immediately turned and looked at what was happening on the inside. It was the only remaining place I had not examined, partly out of a sense of fear over what I would potentially find. I realized that first and foremost, my consciousness was fraught with ongoing worries and fears. It was so murky and clouded by all my extraneous thoughts slash feelings that there was no capacity for anything positive. It was as if I was tuned in to a radio station that played all sorts of worrisome, fear, negative and degrading programming all round the clock. While I had read about manifestation principles from various books out there, I was still not applying this information in my life. I knew on a theoretical level that negative thoughts would somehow lead to negative manifestations, but I was allowing myself to behave in a way contrary to this knowledge that I had. You'll notice that this is prevalent in our society, in which many experts and knowledgeable individuals allow themselves to act in ways that are contrary to the information which they possess. This behavior does not imply that they are irrational in any way, but instead indicates missing links in the information that have to be clarified further. While I was taught over the years by various spiritual teachers that negative thoughts generally lead to negative outcomes, the leap from one to the other was difficult for me to accept. I still did not have the conscious awareness to perceive the whole creation process from start to end. I knew there had to be intervening steps in between, which I later identified as part of the full manifestation sequence, but I did not know what these were. And so, with the second realization that there were ongoing negative thoughts inside of myself and with a vague knowledge that negative thoughts somehow lead to negative outcomes, I set out on a journey to reduce the frequency of these thoughts slash feelings within myself. This was the part which was the most difficult for me because I was going against the social and mental conditioning I received for the first few decades of my life. I was working to undo a lifetime of negative habits slash conditioning. While difficult, it was also through this process that I came across many of the techniques and steps that you read about in my books today. As a result of trying to find practical ways and means to reduce my fears and worries on the inside, I was able to document and write about these techniques with a sense of intimacy and realism that many spiritual teachers may have overlooked. Maybe all of this came naturally to them, but certainly not for me. I had to struggle considerably to rid myself of my inner fears and worries, to let them go for good. For me, this aspect of the process is really the key because it is the part where the least guidance is given. When I moved from merely reading about the techniques to applying them, I realized that application was the missing key all along. I merely knew these truths at a superficial level but have not realized them for myself. Immediate results occurred the moment I took active steps to reduce my negative thoughts and feelings on the inside. The physical results which I have been seeking so fervently for years started showing up for me on the outside. I was delighted and thrilled beyond words at my initial success. It was also after I tasted this initial success that I realized I should not feel discouraged in the face of seeming difficulties, no matter how arduous the process seemed. The ego, actually my past mental conditioning, was not going to give up without a fight. It was still going to sneak me fearsome and worrisome thoughts the moment it had the chance to. But I now had the confirmation that I was moving in the right direction. All I needed to do was to continue in this direction. You too, will discover as you engage in this inner work that the good you seek starts flowing to you. The results will probably be modest at first but they are positive proof that you are moving in the right direction. If you will only keep at your daily practice with some persistence, then you have to get there one day. The there I'm referring to is not some exalted end state where you no longer function in the world, but one in which you are completely free from negative feelings of fear, 
worry and self-doubt. You'll still enjoy many of the things you used to do, but your mindset will be completely different. It is a wonderfully liberating state to be in. For example, you may still work in your existing vocation, but instead of resenting it and doing it for the money, you now start to see how your work has the potential to help others. In turn, the money takes care of itself in your life. Once you have tasted some success of being in this state, you'll never want to revert back to your old ways again. This is the reason why I often encourage my readers to try out these teachings for themselves instead of just taking my word for it. My physical words do no good other than to add to all their existing theoretical knowledge, the garbage, which has no power. It is only when they apply these teachings for themselves that they come to recognize their own power. Therefore, a conscious and sustained application is the key, not merely hearing about how someone has done it, or reading testimonials from people who have done it. I am often amused that some individuals would expend much of their time and effort asking for proof or confirmation from others in an attempt to convince themselves that something works. The universe does not work this way. All the proof in the universe is useless if it is not proven by yourself in your own reality. The moment someone tastes their first fruits of success, my work is more than half done. The momentum will propel them towards where they need to go. The good that you seek is seeking you. This is a statement commonly heard in spiritual circles, but what does it really mean? To me, the full significance of this phrase sank in only after I made my earlier two realizations. I discovered that I was being called in the direction of my greatest good all along and that I would have found it sooner or later. There was nothing withholding my good from me. There was only the search process that could have taken a shorter or longer time depending on my prevailing beliefs, my consciousness. How long this search process took depended on how much work I did on myself and how quickly I connected the dots. Working on myself shortened the process, while blaming others and feeling resentful about the success of others prolonged it. All the dots have been there since the beginning. I just needed to connect them in the right sequence. And I would connect them someday no matter what, simply because I wanted the truth so badly. In the same way, know that the good you seek is seeking you. This is what spiritual teachers mean when they say we all have the seeds of greatness within us. The seeds have already been planted. You have, through your broader intentions, put yourself on this path of personal development. If you'll just relax into your goodness and take one step at a time, one day at a time, you'll get there one day. In fact, you'll get there with the very first step you make, starting from the very next chapter. Results show up even in the very early stages as I have discovered for myself. My intention is to help you get there in the shortest possible time with the least struggle. But you will get there no matter what, simply because you want it so much. In some sense, we all will stop at nothing. The same applies to the tangible objects and goals which you have set in your life. You will get them one day because you have been asking for them so much. However, the counterintuitive truth is that you will get there even faster if you learn how to intend in line with broader universal principles. Things are always easier when you have the universe on your side. It goes without saying that you should read the first book of this series, Light Touch Manifestations, if you have not. That book provides a good primer and necessary foundation for the application of the advanced techniques in this book. It also helps if you've had some sort of an introduction to my previous body of work. As the focus of this book is on what happens after you have let go of your various negative feelings, I will not be covering the various techniques to let go of negative feelings in detail here. It is helpful to read my earlier books if you need help in that area. And as always, you do not need this book, or any other book for that matter, to get to where you want to be in life, although this book certainly makes it much easier and more enjoyable for you. The process is like finding your way around in a foreign country. You can certainly get to the zoo by asking for directions from strangers or by following the street signs. 
You certainly do not need to buy that tourist map to end up at your destination, but doing so would save you from lots of struggle and headache trying to figure out the directions by yourself. In the same way, this book serves as that map. It will not get you there magically, but it can make your journey much more enjoyable. When you finally give up worrying over whether you are traveling in the right direction and simply sit back to enjoy the ride, you realize it is the ride which you have signed up for in the first place and not really the destinations. The destinations, manifestations, themselves are often fleeting but the ride is one now moment after another. Wouldn't it be glorious if you can enjoy the ride plus all the destinations along the way? Of course you can, and this book is about having the best of both worlds. Chapter 2, The Nature of Our Manifestation Canvas As I look back at my life, I am often amazed by the incredible transformations that have taken place within a very short time. I used to think that creating massive changes in one's live would take an inordinate amount of time that change was a difficult, slow, and arduous process. However, once I started making some progress, I realized that change can be instant. It is the process of preparing for change, and convincing ourselves, that takes a long time. When all the groundwork has been done, when we no longer sabotage our own efforts or second-guess ourselves, changes can occur just like that, with a snap of the fingers. This is the first principle to keep in mind when doing this work. Leave the element of time out of the equation and leave it entirely up to the universe. When you free yourself from any preconceived notions of how long it will or should take, you free the universe to work its magic. The greatest changes that have occurred for me are on the inside. I used to walk around with a sickening, worried feeling in my gut all day long, from the moment I was awake to the moment I fell asleep at night. I had trouble falling asleep on most nights because my worrisome thoughts kept me awake, along with all the doomsday scenarios it projected. If you had asked me whether I thought it was possible to free myself from those worrying and fear thoughts back then, the answer would have been a resounding no. I came to identify with those thoughts so strongly that I wrongly saw them as a part of my being. I saw them as a part of myself. The truth is that our thoughts and feelings are never a part of ourselves. Just as the clothes you wear are not a part of your physical body, the feelings and thoughts you think are not a part of your higher self. They merely cloud whatever is there and prevent us from ever recognizing the true self. This is also the reason why I could create massive changes in my outer reality once I reduced the frequency and magnitude of my ongoing negative thoughts. With each negative feeling that I dropped, I became a little freer and lighter. I came to recognize the powerful creator that I had always been, free and untethered from anything else. Although I only saw part of the blank canvas while I worked at dropping those negative thoughts, that was sufficient to spur me on and create results in my outer reality. You'll be surprised at how much effort we exert to perpetuate our undesired realities. An inordinate amount of physical effort and energy is required to worry all day. When I let even a bit of that worry go, I found my energy levels rising and my mood improving. You have now freed up much of the universal energy that is always flowing through you. Instead of focusing that energy on your negative worrisome thoughts, you are now freeing up that energy to better use. We all have a blank canvas which we create from on an ongoing basis. This blank canvas is our consciousness. For the ease of exposition, I shall refer to our consciousness as our inner states that which holds whatever is happening inside of us at any point in time. Your inner state holds the keys to your reality and outer manifestations. It's as simple as that. If you drop into and observe your inner state right now, just by gently closing your eyes and noticing what is there, you'll see the connection between your inner state and your outer reality. I recall my inner state to be tumultuous in the early days of my journey and filled with a constant sense of fear that something was about to go wrong. In turn, my outer reality reflected that. Because I always expected things to go wrong, they did. Because I prepared myself for lack on the inside, 
I often encountered lackful situations on the outside. The nature of our universe is such that it can only reflect back to us what we hold on the inside and nothing else. Our inner state is the blank canvas which we create from. However, this canvas is not blank for many people. It is filled with negative thoughts, worries, past programmings and social conditioning. One may look at all of this negative stuff that is in there and feel discouraged. They may think it is futile to go against a lifetime, or even several lifetimes, of negative programming. However, my experience has been that it is useful even if we do some of the work. In other words, you will find positive results happening very quickly in your experience even if you do not get to zero. Even if you cleared out just 1% of your negative feelings or programs, you would still have made significant progress for incredible results to show in your outer reality. I can personally attest to this. Back in my early days when I made even a very slight progress in my inner state, for example, through the clearing up of a small issue that was bugging me on the inside, the results still presented themselves quickly on the outside. The converse is also true, if you do not take the necessary steps to make these small changes, they will forever remain a part of your consciousness. You will be bothered by them until you address them and be free from them. So the first step is to let go of any negative feelings and thoughts that arise spontaneously on the inside. As mentioned, my previous books provide ample guidance in that area so I shall skip that for now. What I want to focus on in this chapter is on our reactive tendencies. Once you have dropped all the negative feelings that arise spontaneously on the inside, the next stage would be to observe how you react and respond to others in your daily life. For example, do you spontaneously feel a sense of anger or irritation when dealing with certain people? Does something your spouse or children say make you flare up? Does a particular situation or scenario rile you up or make you feel irritated? All of these situations provide valuable opportunities for us to practice and deepen our inner work. Observe the situations that frequently rile you up and make you feel unsettled. This may range from a feeling of slight irritation to immense anger on the inside. Again, the actual content of the situation does not matter. What matters here is that there is something in each situation that sets off the trigger for us. Know that it is never about the other person or the specifics of the outer event. It is always about us. By this, I do not mean that you should take the blame or criticize yourself for reacting in this way. Instead, treat it as a learning opportunity to see why you are reacting in this manner. Behind each of our reactive tendencies lies a hidden or somewhat unconscious belief. Once this belief is brought to light and addressed, the negative reaction disappears as well. The negative reaction of anger slash pride slash irritation slash frustration often points to a deeper belief that needs to be addressed, dropped, and not suppressed. Very often, we are afraid to look at what lies beneath the surface, which is why we are so ready to point our fingers at the other party. He is making me feel this way, or she did something which upset me. The truth is that absolutely nothing in this world can make you upset if not for some negative programming which that thing called up within you. I shall illustrate this with a couple of examples before offering some steps for you to identify similar situations in your own life. You'll see this playing out in your life in various forms. There was a period in my life where I was extremely offended by rude salespeople. Not surprisingly, I began attracting many of them into my reality. They should provide better service. They should treat their customers with basic courtesy and respect, were the common statements which I used to justify my own feelings of anger and frustration over the matter. It helps to take a look at how we inadvertently hold on to our negative feelings through justifications like this. As I mentioned, Pointing the finger at the other party often belies the greater spiritual truth beneath the surface. After a few occurrences of this, I sat down and took a good look at my inner state. The good news is that you do not have to share any of this inner work with others. 
You can do all of this on the inside by yourself. There is no need to tell the world what you are doing. In fact, I strongly encourage that you keep all of the inner work you're doing to yourself because the most progress can be made in this manner, free from the better judgments of others. I started off by asking myself, what is causing the anger here? Of course, my ego was insistent and immediately answered, the rude salesperson and his slash her rudeness. But I did not give up so easily. I probed even deeper by asking the question, why is it that others can have the exact same experience as me and walk away totally unruffled while I was so affected? That was the real key to solving the puzzle. In fact, it gave me a clue and ultimately made me see the light. I was in a restaurant one day with a friend. I was offended by the rude waitress while this friend of mine was unfazed. I was surprised, to say the least. I thought everyone would have reacted in the same way as I did upon receiving that bad treatment. The fact that we do not always react in the same way indicates that these outer circumstances are not the root cause of the issue. The root cause lies in our underlying beliefs. Upon asking myself the second question, I began to receive slash know the answers to my question. In fact, a bigger part of me had already known it all along. I was just afraid to acknowledge the truth. I was offended because I was craving recognition from the service staff. I wanted them to treat me as important. Whenever they did not, I perceived that they were looking down on me. I was feeling self-righteous and superior to them. Once these answers came flowing out of myself, it was easy to see why I had avoided confronting the truth all along. The truth was not very pleasant to begin with. But one has to confront these difficult truths for spiritual progress to be made in the first place. The good news is that no one knows we are doing this except for ourselves. This is why I said in the beginning that there is no need to share what you are doing with anyone else if you do not want to. I have made it a point not to share any of these with my family slash friends around me. The only exception is using them as illustrative examples in these books. Spiritual people often have a difficult time making inner progress because they have disowned these parts of themselves. Instead of embracing them as a part of life, they have come to shun these shadow aspects. We often repress these feelings further into our unconscious where they are free to recur in other parts of our life. I often teach that you only need to deal with a negative belief once, and it will be gone from your consciousness forever. You will be free from it for good. I did not judge or criticize myself for what lay beneath the surface. Instead, I merely recognized that it could have been embedded there somewhere along the way, through social conditioning or programming, when I was less conscious. What is more important is to drop these beliefs slash feelings now that I have become aware of them. I began to ask myself the question, can I let go of my feeling of self-importance slash pride? This sense of pride stemmed from the ego and the ego will not give up without a fight. But if you are persistent at letting go, you'll start finding the pride transforming into some other feeling, until you finally let go of all of it. In this case, the feeling of pride or self-importance gave way to a feeling of fear. A sense of pride is always driven by a sense of deep insecurity or fear, hence the need to put up a false front. Once I let go of those feelings of insecurity or fear, the need to put up any false fronts disappeared. The need to make a favorable impression and impress others, salespersons, superiors, co-workers, friends, disappeared. What remained was the blank canvas, that pristine inner state that has always been and always will be. What I have just described above was for a single case. While I have condensed the process into a few paragraphs, the actual process took a few months for me during which I let go of different aspects of the issue one bit at a time. There is no need to rush to let go of anything or get things done by a certain time. What needs to be done will be done in perfect timing once you make a decision to do it. Thus, don't strain yourself in the process. Just let go of a little bit of the issue as it arises, one bit at a time. 
The most interesting part occurs after we have dealt with an issue sufficiently on the inside. This is what I refer to as the testing phase, in which we deliberately and playfully go out into the outside world to see whether the same situation still ruffles our feathers. One may be surprised to learn that when we drop our negative beliefs on the inside, we immediately come into contact with a completely transformed reality on the outside. It is as if all the rude salespeople and everything that has bothered us in the past have suddenly been barreled and transported to another planet. Actually they have. They are on a completely different vibration and frequency from us now, such that we stop attracting them and they stop attracting us. Because of our changed inner state, we are no longer in a position to attract them. Another possibility is that due to our residual vibrations from the past, or from not dropping the issues completely, we still meet with a few of these cases, albeit with much less regularity. When this happens, notice how you feel on the inside. You'll notice, if you have done enough of the inner work, that the situation no longer ruffles your feathers and bothers you as much as before. If it does, all you need to do is to go back to your inner laboratory and do the inner work again. I am often secretly amazed at how I am able to sit through the exact same situation as before, or even witness the situation happening to another person, while being completely unaffected by it. The same situation on the outside no longer presses those hot buttons on the inside. When you realize this, you would have made significant progress. What I have just described above is different from a state of apathy, which is a helpless state of inaction that some people convince themselves into. A state of apathy sets in when we perceive a situation as unchangeable and we resign ourselves to it. You can identify apathetic people around because they are always devoid of energy and life. They are always trudging along and dragging their feet. They may say things like, forget it. Here comes another rude salesperson again. I have accepted this as a fact of life. What we see here is not true acceptance but a sense of resignation instead. They have conditioned themselves so much that they have suppressed their usual reactive tendencies. It is little wonder that these individuals are often bursting with anger slash frustration at the seams and ready to snap at the slightest provocation. Repressing one's negative feelings is never the right way to deal with them. Here is another example to help you identify similar situations in your own life. Again, the specifics of your experience will vary but the features will be the same a recurring situation in your life that literally drives you crazy and makes you react in the same way each time you encounter it. Very often, these are seemingly small things in our lives and we can never understand why we react in such a disproportionate manner. But the truth is that beneath each small thing lies a huge inner belief to deal with. It is this huge inner belief that is causing the exaggerated outer reaction. I used to be very annoyed when a driver suddenly cut in front of my car with inches to spare, and more so if he did not raise his hand to apologize or thank me for letting him in. This seemed to be a trivial matter on the face of it so I wasn't sure why it triggered such a huge reaction in me each time it happened. Why am I so offended by these rude drivers? I asked myself. That's because they are ungracious and a menace to all road users. You should be offended, my ego readily responded to justify my anger. By now I knew much better than that, so I probed deeper to find the root cause of the outer reaction. What was causing this huge reaction in me on the outside? Why was I reacting in this manner that was out of character for me? The answers always appear when one is ready and receptive to them. Once again, the answers rang out loud and clear for me, and they were not what I wanted to hear. Still, I had to admit that those were the right answers. I was reacting in such a manner because I felt unappreciated. I felt that the driver had not reciprocated my kindness in some way. I realized this to be a recurring theme in my life and even somewhat related to the earlier situation of rude salespeople, in which I felt I was not valued as a customer. Once I brought these hidden beliefs to light, I began to see the situation for what it really is. 
For the first time, I realized that it had never been about rude drivers or rude salespeople at all. It has always been about myself and the beliefs which I held on the inside. I reacted in that way because I believed that my kindness was unappreciated. I wanted approval from those drivers. I wanted those strangers to think of me as kind and helpful. How absurd is that? Wanting to control other people's perceptions and how they thought of me. Wanting to look to the outside and to others for approval and recognition when I already had all of it within myself. Seeing the situation in its fullness released much of those negative beliefs and feelings when I fully understood what caused my behavior. I was no longer a slave to the situation which I could not fully comprehend. The most exciting part came when I drove the next day. This time, I found myself completely unperturbed when drivers cut abruptly into my lane. My previous sense of irritation has suddenly been transformed into a sense of joy and appreciation at the situation. How could that be? I have seen the folly of the situation and how I was using external events like this to gain approval or recognition for myself. But why go to such extended ways to do so? We only have to drop those feelings of undeservingness slash unworthiness on the inside to be completely free. I used to blame myself for reacting or blowing up at something as it was the most unspiritual thing to do, but now I bless all of it as a golden opportunity to practice. Of course, it is hard to be thankful in the heat of the moment when you feel those negative emotions inside of you. If you'll just step back for a moment and ask why, the answers will be revealed to you in the most remarkable way. All that is required is your honesty. As spiritual author Brian Cady puts it, there is nothing so dark that we cannot put it on paper, question it, and set ourselves free. Once you have identified the underlying beliefs driving your reactive tendencies, you can let those beliefs go immediately and the behavior will dissolve by itself. There is no need to hold on to them forever. I estimate that there were only four to five major reactive tendencies that I needed to get rid of when I began doing the inner work. You'll realize that your reactive tendencies are often related to one another or that they share some underlying theme slash commonality. That is a good thing, because when you work on just one of them, you become free from the other related tendencies as well. The greatest value in dropping all your negative reactive tendencies is that your inner state becomes a pristine, blank canvas for most of your waking hours. You are no longer letting someone else draw on your canvas. You get to consciously decide what you want to create instead of letting your unconscious beliefs run the game as they've done for so long. I often found myself mulling over a single bad encounter with a salesperson for days. You'll find some people stewing in their negative encounters for weeks to months on end. By the time they're done with harping over one encounter, which was in fact brought about by their own beliefs, another one happens to take its place. That is the silliest thing to do in the world because you're hurting no one other than yourself. You're letting all these negative experiences cloud your manifestation canvas when you can just drop them, and be free from them, just like that. Remember that you want your canvas to be as blank as possible. When you become free of your usual negative reactive tendencies, you will find your consciousness in an unclouded state of zero for most of the day. This is the place where magic and miracles reside, and the state from which they can be part of your physical reality. Chapter 3, Beyond Manifestations The more I do the inner work, the more I realize that the art of manifestation is not about attracting something from out there into our lives. Rather, it is about dropping anything in our inner states that is not in harmony with our broader intentions and desires. What are some things that are out of harmony or contradictory to our intentions? For one, negative feelings are particularly destructive. Negative feelings of any form, fear, worry, anger, jealousy, irritation, frustration, guilt or shame, just to name a few, cloud our inner states and prevent us from manifesting what we truly want. Instead, we end up attracting more events, people, and circumstances that match the vibrations of those negative states held. 
For example, an individual who constantly walks around feeling irritated and angry on the inside draws unto himself more events, people, and circumstances to feel angry about, which will in turn cause him to feel even angrier, and hence the negative cycle perpetuates for the rest of his life. This often happens on an unconscious level, with the individual not realizing that he is at the center of his universe. He is the root cause and sole creator of all the negative experiences in his life, yet he does not realize it. These individuals often ascribe their resultant pain and suffering to external causes, blaming other people and events for their unhappiness like what I used to do. Conversely, an individual who is in a state of joy and happiness most of the time, for whatever reason, draws to himself more things to feel joyful about thus perpetuating the positive upward cycle of happiness in his life. Am I therefore suggesting that we think positively all day long and adopt a Pollyannish attitude to life? That could certainly work if we found a way to make ourselves do it with enough consistency. But positive thinking falls flat on its face for most people because we cannot keep at it. Why is this so? Simply because it takes an inordinate amount of effort and energy to think positive, just as it takes an inordinate amount of energy to think negative. When someone deliberately attempts to engage in positive thinking, he is often going against a lifetime, or several decades, of negative conditioning. He is trying to think positive in spite of all the beliefs and programs on the inside that are causing him to default to his usual negative thoughts. That is why we are often thoroughly exhausted by the process and find positive thinking to be such a chore. It's like we have to pretend to be happy when we are not. We are trying to be upbeat and cheery by conjuring up happy thoughts, in turn repressing our negative feelings. I have often taught that spiritual work is never about a forceful conjuring of positive feelings within us. Instead, it is always about honoring our feelings, if you have to work hard at something, then you are not in line with the universal flow. I've seen spiritual people fall prey to this exact phenomenon. After starting on some spiritual path, such as following a particular meditation practice or religion, these individuals become convinced that they should, all of a sudden, be immune to any form of negative thinking or feelings. They start blaming and criticizing themselves when they notice these feelings within themselves, or start denying the existence of these feelings, often with a sense of disgust. It is quite common for a self-proclaimed spiritual individual to deny that he is feeling angry, lustful, or jealous, as doing so would seem rather unspiritual in nature. In turn, these individuals are quick to judge and point out these tendencies in others. They would be the first to tell you that you should not feel a certain way as it is not spiritual to do so. Incidentally, this is also the reason why I have stayed away from spiritual groups as they can sometimes hamper instead of help. Unless everyone within the group is at a high level of consciousness, the group will be dominated by one or two self-righteous individuals who see it fit to point out and criticize the apparent shortcomings of others based on their own misguided views. Let us make it clear now that the only reason why we should not hold on to any negative feelings is because they will eventually lead to unwanted manifestations in our reality. Negative feelings, if immersed in and held for some time, lead to unwanted events and circumstances on the outside through the manifestation sequence, described in light touch manifestations. This is the reason why negative feelings are not recommended. It is not because negative feelings are some kind of a sin by themselves, but rather, because they keep us trapped in our ways. We end up getting caught in a downward spiraling negative cycle for most of our lives without even knowing it. I would have been trapped in the downward cycle of destructive fear and worrying if I had not snapped myself out of it in time. Therefore, the core of these teachings is to allow yourself to be free from the claws of these negative feelings. What I am suggesting here goes beyond positive thinking. Many individuals have the misconception that in order for the law of attraction to work in their lives, they'll need to think and feel positive thoughts as like attract likes. What I realized is that we expend unnecessary effort slash energy in doing so. 
Instead, all we simply have to do is to drop our negative feelings and anything that is not in harmony with our conscious intentions. That is the only thing you have to do for all the magic, miracles and manifestations to happen in your life. Forcefully conjuring up positive feelings often means an artificial suppression of the negative feelings instead of an acknowledgement of their existence. When you acknowledge that the negative elements are there, you can start taking steps to drop them from your consciousness instead of allowing them to control you. This is a good time to recap the manifestation sequence which we covered in Light Touch Manifestations before going further. Recall that the sequence which leads to outer manifestations goes like this. 1. Unconscious memories slash beliefs equals equals, 2. Conscious thoughts equals equals, 3. Feelings and emotions in our inner state equals equals, 4. Physical manifestations in our outer world. In light touch manifestations, my focus was mainly on dropping the negative feelings and emotions that continuously occupied our inner states. In the last chapter, my focus was on letting go of the unconscious reactive tendencies that dominate our inner states and therefore our outer reality. By studying the recurring patterns in our reactive tendencies, we can often get at the 1. Unconscious memories and beliefs that are driving them. This book proposes an even more advanced path to manifestations. I'll first explain the broader principles in this chapter before expanding on them in the rest of this book. Before I do so, a reminder is in order. This advanced path will not work for you if your inner state is constantly dominated by negative feelings most of the time. You must get your inner state down to 50% negative feelings, or less, in order to benefit fully from the techniques and exercises in this book. This is not because you are undeserving of the good which you ask for, but because of the nature of our universe. As such, if you are reading this book in a deep state of fear or worry, then please go back and try out the exercises in Light Touch Manifestations, or any of my other books, until you experience a sense of relief from the reduction of your negative feelings. In other words, your negative feelings, no matter what they are, have to go before you will see results from the techniques here. Conventional self-help literature advocates a forceful positive thinking and motivational approach that ignores all the unconscious programming that is already there. I have already explained how this is counterproductive and unsustainable. According to the manifestation sequence, the key to creating our desired realities is to drop everything that is unwanted and not in line with our highest intentions. Therefore, if there is a way to completely drop the first component of the sequence, our unconscious memories and beliefs, then our ensuing days would be filled with an infinite stream of manifestations because there will no longer be any, two, self-defeating conscious thoughts as a result of those, one, unconscious beliefs, which would mean no resultant, three, feelings and hence no undesired, four, outer manifestations. As such, the dropping of our, one, unconscious memories and beliefs is the key. While this may seem obvious on hindsight looking at the entire manifestation sequence, it wasn't obvious to me in the beginning. It hadn't occurred to me that the whole key to ongoing, infinite manifestations in our lives would be the complete dropping of our unconscious beliefs and memories. Rather, I had previously thought what was possible was only the piecemeal dropping of negative feelings as they came up within us. Therefore, I dealt with each negative feeling, belief, or tendency as it came up in my life and recommended that my readers do the same. While this practice produced massive results in my own life, it wasn't until the whole blueprint of possibilities came through for me one night that I realized what I was missing out on. Chapter 4, Developing a Moment-by-Moment -moment Awareness one thing I learned early on from Abraham Hicks is that the universe always answers whenever you ask. This means that the universe is standing by, ready to respond to your slightest intentions and desires, no matter how big or small they are. Energy flows in direct response to our intentions the moment we hold them. Whether we are able to receive this response from the universe depends on whether our inner states are clouded out by our negative feelings and mind chatter. 
We perceive this universal impulse to the extent that our inner states are clear and pristine. I have also learned that the universe gets through to us in our own unique ways and will choose the ways which we are the most receptive to. I've had the universe communicate with me in different ways at each stage of my journey. In the beginning when I did not believe that any form of direct communication was possible, the universe did so by dropping book names and planting people and opportunities into my life. As I progressed and came to understand the true nature of the universe, I found myself in instances of direct knowing, in which I just knew something to be absolutely true without any external proof or evidence necessary. In fact, we all have a direct line to the universe which becomes obvious once we drop our emotional baggage. It was under these circumstances that the next piece of the puzzle came through for me. I was lying in bed one night and gently lulling myself to sleep. I usually do so by making myself extremely comfortable in bed, sniffing my pillow, yes I still do that now, and feeling an overwhelming sense of gratitude for everything in my life. This is a non-resistant state that I lull myself into every night just before I fall asleep. When we are non-resistant, we move along with the gentle flow of the universe and that was when it happened. All of a sudden, I started receiving what could only be best described as universal impulses. Ideas and information came flowing into my head. I knew these ideas were not mine, since I had not logically developed them in my head over a period of time. Instead, these well-formed concepts and information just started appearing in my consciousness as a sense of knowingness. There was a feeling of deep understanding that it was the truth, and that no external proof or validation was necessary. In that moment, I instantly recognized the information to be the next piece of the puzzle. It was just the next piece I needed to make sense of the manifestation sequence. It was given in response to questions which I have asked. I lay in bed for a while taking in all this information and seeing it play out like a mental movie in my mind. The feeling was distinct from that of daydreaming, where one feels they have a hand in spinning up all of that imagined imagery. Here I felt more like a neutral observer instead of an active participant. It felt as if I was watching something unfold in my mind's eye without my active intervention, while nodding in agreement along with all of it. It must have been 10 minutes before I realized I had to write all of that information down. I would not be able to remember it the next morning. I jumped out of bed, scrambled to find whatever scraps of paper I could and started jotting this information down. The universe had given me a blueprint, a series of steps that answered the fundamental question we raised in the previous chapter. How does one let go of all their unconscious beliefs and memories? I had filled out six full pages with my scrawls and scribbles by the time I was done. I knew my work in receiving this information was complete. What I had to do next was to apply this information in my own life and share it with my readers. I have the original notes spread out across my desk now as I write. I realize that I would have dismissed this information had the universe given it to me at an earlier point in my journey. First, I would not have recognized the significance of the information as it would have seemed preposterous. Second, my previous skepticism and disbelief in how the universe could talk directly to us would have precluded any forms of communication in this manner. Yet as I have discovered over time, direct communication, a sense of inner knowing, is the predominant mode through which the universe communicates with us all of the time. Spiritual masters have done so throughout the ages, communicating directly with the universe with no intermediary. This form of communication is available to us once we are open and ready for it. It is the most accurate and efficient way for the universe to send us signals and impulses. The first concept which the universe showed me was the importance of developing a moment-by-moment -moment awareness. This means becoming acutely aware of everything that happens in your inner state in each and every moment of your life. Most people walk around with barely any form of awareness or knowledge over what is happening in their inner states. They don't even realize they are feeling angry and acting in a certain way until it is brought to their attention. 
they let their feelings and emotions run their lives and overcome them. We move through so many different emotional and feeling states each day that we become numb to them. We don't even realize the myriad of emotions we go through in the normal course of each day. The irony is that each one of these feelings we experience throughout the day then goes on to create our outer reality in some way. How can we become conscious creators if we do not become aware of how we are feeling on the inside? These feelings plant the seeds for our future manifestations. It is not enough to just develop an occasional awareness of how you feel on the inside. One thing the universe impressed upon me is that there has to be an ongoing, moment-by-moment -moment awareness. There has to be full awareness of what happens on the inside. For someone who is used to an outer-directed way of living and has not observed his inner state before, it is all right to start by consciously observing it a few times each day and making a mental note. This allows one to realize that he is not as helpless as previously believed, that our conscious thoughts do go on to create our outer reality in some way. But as one progresses in doing the inner work, our outer-directed focus must be substituted for an inner-directed focus. We must start dwelling on the inside for most of the time instead of placing our attention on external people, circumstances, and events. Living on the inside means becoming especially aware of how we feel on the inside from the moment we are awake to the moment we are asleep at night. Whenever I notice any negative feelings in my inner state, I do not label, judge, or blame myself for them. Instead, I simply notice the feelings which are there and proceed to drop them immediately, thereby restoring my inner state to one of love and peace. I do not engage in the thoughts themselves. I do this all throughout the day to maintain a blank canvas and be at that zero state which is so conducive for outer manifestations. For example, I noticed some irritation welling up within me as I stand in a queue. Without cultivating a moment-by-moment -moment awareness, this slight sense of irritation would go on to color my perception of life but otherwise go unnoticed by me. I would not have questioned it or taken the steps to let it go. With some awareness, I realized that the source of my irritation came from observing a man at the front of the queue who was treating the store clerk rudely. Instead of engaging in my thoughts by thinking along those lines, for example, he should be more polite. I can't believe he is doing this, I immediately drop my feelings of irritation by letting them go. Three rounds later, the irritation is completely gone and I am completely at peace with the situation. The stranger can behave in whatever way he likes and I am totally okay with it. His behavior no longer brings up any negative feelings within myself. This inner practice is not about changing the world in any way. You'll realize that the world needs no changing. The only thing that needs to be changed is our own erroneous perceptions of the world. My initial sense of irritation arose because I perceived a need to change the situation. I wanted the man to treat the store clerk nicely. I wanted the man to change his behavior. But we have already learned that it is impossible to change anyone's behavior from the outside. It is impossible to control reality in the usual outer-directed ways of operation that we have become accustomed to. Let all of that go and forget about changing your outer reality directly. Instead, the answer is to go deep within yourself. When you resolve all the negative feelings at their source, you realize, perhaps ironically, that nothing needs to be changed in the first place. You become at peace with everything and everyone. More strangely, you find yourself in lesser contact with situations that used to bother you in the past. Once I cleared up my feelings of irritation on the inside, I was free from them forever. I no longer felt irritated by certain circumstances and I no longer invited circumstances that irritated me. This is only possible if we give up insisting that other people change their behavior for us. A few things happen once we adopt this practice of developing a moment-by-moment -moment awareness. In the beginning, there is often a sense of surprise as we discover the emotional roller coaster that we put ourselves on every day. No wonder we are so exhausted by life itself. 
We are propelled from one high point to one low point with everything in between. The great news is that all of this is completely optional. The emotional roller coaster ride which you have placed yourself on is not a necessity as you go through life. You can choose to be at the zero point of peace which means moving from one high point to the next, and to the next. Life can be one moment of peace after another, without any of the downsides of a downward ride. By developing a moment-by-moment -moment awareness, we pick out the subtle negative feelings of irritation, worry, frustration, helplessness, lust, jealousy, anger or fear that have the tendency to culminate into more powerful negative feelings. We nip these feelings in their bud before they have a chance to develop, thus preventing them from clouding our moment-to-moment -moment life experience. Note that we do not suppress, ignore, these feelings or pretend that they do not exist. This practice is more important in the manifestation process than most people realize. It's like switching the tinted sunglasses you have been wearing all your life with clear ones, or better still, ditching your eyeglasses altogether. The difference in your life experience will amaze you. The second realization is that the dropping of negative slash unwanted feelings has to be an ongoing affair. That's why there is a need to adopt a moment-by-moment -moment awareness. The best analogy I've found for this is the windscreen of my automobile. It may be clean just after I'm out of a car wash, but daily driving exposes the windscreen to all sorts of external elements animal droppings, rain, snow, sleet, dirt, and so on. What do we do the moment these particles start to obscure our vision? That's right, we activate the automatic windscreen washer intuitively. If that does not work, we either drive to the nearest car wash or get to work with our microfiber towels. We do so because we know the consequences of not having a clear view while driving on the road. Why do so many people allow their negative feelings to accumulate inside of them? Just as dirt particles cloud our field of vision as we drive, negative feelings cloud our perception of life and go on to affect our outer manifestations. Become as persistent at dropping your negative feelings as you are at getting those dirt particles off your windscreen. Just as you do not drive around with a dirty windscreen with your vision obscured, you should stop only when your vision, your perception of life, is completely clear. There is no need to suffer the ongoing consequences of holding on to those negative feelings. Think of your inner state as that windscreen and your negative feelings as the dirt particles that accumulate throughout the day. Cultivate the habit of restoring your inner state to one of peace when you notice something amiss on the inside. Once you accept nothing but absolute clarity, love, and peace for yourself, you'll start to drop these feelings spontaneously once you notice they are there. Chapter 5, Vibrational Incompatibility and the Windscreen of Life The prerequisite for everything that comes next is a clear windscreen and inner state that is not clouded or tainted by our negative feelings. You'll notice magic and miracles just happening spontaneously for you when you walk around in a free state of zero. You don't have to force or will things one way or another, they just are. When your inner vision is clear, you perceive life as the universe perceives it, as it has always meant to be. You realize that everything is perfect in its own way and that everyone is co-creating their reality in their own chosen ways. There is no need for any of it to be different. Everyone is right where they need or want to be. There is no need for you to change any of it. The perceived need for us to change things is only an illusion. This need arises because of the presence of negative feelings within us that make us feel bad. Hence, the conditioned instinct is to remove slash alter those external circumstances which we perceive to be making us feel that way. But that external person or event is not the true cause. The true cause of the situation lies within us, yet we are often too unconscious to see it. We cannot change anything from the outside in. The only way to creation is from the inside out. We all have a hand in co-creating whatever we observe, because through our attention to something, we have created and perpetuated part of the situation. When I understood this, 
I realized I had a hand in creating that negative experience of observing the store clerk being treated rudely. I created it by holding similar vibrations within myself at some point. In other words, the negative vibrations which I held caused me to be in a position to observe that unpleasant interaction. On some level, I was a vibrational match to the vibrations of that situation. Abraham Hicks teach that we will not even be in the physical vicinity of an unpleasant experience if we are not in vibrational alignment with it. This is a key piece of these manifestations teachings because once you understand it, you realize that a person who walks around in a constant state of love and peace can never be in the vicinity of anything unsafe or dangerous. The vibrations of those negative experiences are so incompatible with that individual that it would be a violation of universal law for him to experience, or even observe, them. He can't. He wouldn't even be physically near enough to them. Abraham Hicks' favorite analogy for this is that we cannot expect to set our radio dials on one frequency and receive the signals from another frequency. This is universal law at play here. Once you restore your inner state to one of clarity, peace, and love, you will find that you no longer attract unwanted situations into your life. Neither do you observe them as much, if at all, because your negative feelings do not go on to result in outer manifestations like before. I am often asked if there is a need to say a prayer for safety or perhaps to carry spiritual items around for protection. There is value in all of these if the individual does so from the highest state of love and peace. If one says a prayer with only love and peace within himself, then the prayer will work to reinforce those feelings and keep him out of perceived harm's way. However, and as always, if those prayers are made from a state of extreme fear or a deep belief in danger, then one's inner state holds the key. How does the individual really feel about the situation? Does the individual feel unsafe and insecure as he is saying the prayer and going about his day? If so, those are the dominant vibrations which will go on to result in outer manifestations. I used to be a worry ward who would conjure up negative, doomsday scenarios in my mind all day long. Needless to say, traveling was a chore for me because I needed to plan for every foreseeable contingency and bad thing that could happen. Yet those things seldom happened because I was always in a state of high alert, exerting lots of effort on the flip side to ensure that I was safe such as saying lots of protection prayers and traveling with a ton of luggage. It is quite amusing, although it was certainly not funny to me back then, to realize how foolish I had been. I was spending so much energy and effort pushing in both directions, tiring myself out while getting nowhere. If I had dropped all of that back then, I would still have been safe and sound for universal laws would have kept me only in the vicinity of love and peace. Try this for yourself right now. Take your left palm and put it together with your right palm as if you are praying, but without clasping them together. Hold them out in front of your chest. Notice how your hands move towards the right when you push with your left hand, and towards the left when you push with your right hand. Now push both your palms together at the same time. Notice how your palm stays in the center right in front of your chest despite the tremendous force you're exerting with both hands. Do so with more energy until your palms tremble. Notice how your hands are still at the same spot while you are physically exhausting yourself. This is exactly the mistake which most people make in their daily manifestations resulting in no outer physical results. The left palm represents our positive thoughts and feelings while the right palm represents our negative thoughts and corresponding feelings. What a lot of people do is to allow themselves to get carried away by their negative thoughts, while at the same time saying lots of affirmations and prayers to get what they want. The end result, of course, is that both their positive and negative intentions cancel each other out, leading to little result in either direction. If they will just relax both their hands and let things be, then everything they desired would flow to them in the most amazing way possible. Leave it up to the universe to delight you. All you have to do is to get clear of, drop, any negative feelings that are not in harmony with your broader intentions. 
When you stop pushing with your right hand, there is no longer a need to counter any perceived lack or danger with the left hand. Everything becomes still and at peace. This is why the focus of my teachings is on the constant dropping, letting go, of your negative feelings. Manifestations are not about deliberate positive thinking, because those positive thoughts are often conjured up in order to quell the negative feelings and thoughts that are also present in our consciousness. We'll just be exerting wasted effort in the end, having both palms push against one another. You can free yourself from the needless struggle right now by dropping all your negative feelings at once. What happens when you are at a state of zero? Will there be nothing there? I invite you to experience this free state for yourself just as many of my readers have done so for themselves. When you drop all of those negative feelings on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, you'll notice a sense of spontaneous peace and joy. There will not be nothing there. On the contrary, there has been something there all along. You just have been too caught up in the drama of your negative feelings to notice it. When you peel off everything that is not part of your true nature, you finally see and experience what has been there all along that spontaneous sense of joy and well-being that does not diminish. This sense of well-being is whole and complete by itself. It is not a sense of fake or artificial peace because your positive and negative feelings have cancelled each other out. This purest state of love and peace stems from letting go, because there is no duality in the first place. There are no negative feelings, therefore there is no need to think positive in order to cancel them out. There is nothing to cloud our vision. It is here that we can accurately perceive the true nature of the universe, where everything is good and well. All is well. This is the message which the universe has been trying to send us since the beginning. But how can everything be well if we constantly experience negative events and situations in our reality? That's why so many around us refuse to believe that all is well. They have been taken in by the illusion which is perpetuated by their ongoing negative feelings. When you drop all your negative feelings, you wipe your inner windscreen clear. You finally get to perceive reality as it is, unadulterated and untainted by any of your false projections, beliefs, or fears. There is no need to push or go against anything. When you reach this state, you'll realize that all is indeed well and has always been well. Your actions from this state will come from a perspective of highest love and peace instead of lack. If you decide to do anything, you do it from a place of plenty instead of a fear of lack. For example, you decide to exercise and eat healthily because doing so makes you feel so good. You go from an abundance of health to even greater abundance. There is no lack thinking that dominates your consciousness. On the other hand, it is also possible to exercise and eat healthily from the perspective of fear and lack. There are many individuals who force themselves to eat a strict diet and exercise because of their fear of ill health. But ill health, just like any physical manifestation, cannot be compatible with you if you come from that highest state of love and peace. Don't be like the person I was before, exerting so much effort in both directions and tiring myself out in the process. We see this in individuals around us who spend an inordinate amount of energy fearing poor health, and then putting intense efforts into preventing possible diseases. These are the ones who restrict themselves to a strict diet and exercise regime. Some individuals who have been on a healthy diet with absolutely no bad lifestyle habits have suddenly fallen prey to serious diseases. Could something else be at work here? Could it be the inner states and vibrations of these individuals? I have often taught that while two individuals may be engaged in the same outer directed actions, their starting points and inner states can be vastly different, leading to different outcomes. Give up all the needless struggle and fears in your own life. This is why having a moment-by-moment -moment awareness is so valuable. Let go of any petty fears the moment you notice them. Also let go of some of your bigger fears. You do not have to immerse yourself in them. You'll notice all sorts of irrational fears coming through during the day. What if there is a fire? 
What if the building collapses? What if there is a terrorist attack? When if my trousers suddenly drop in front of everyone? What if she doesn't like me? What if my car breaks down? What do you think is the root cause of these often irrational fears? That's right, social conditioning through the various news medias and outlets we are exposed to all day, as well as residual vibrations we have been holding onto. Whenever such irrational fears show up within yourself, gently let them go. They may show up again at a later time, but just as you deal with that bird dropping on your windscreen for now instead of worrying about future droppings, you deal with any fear or negative feelings in the now moment. Don't proceed with your life until you get clear in the now moment. If you'll do so with sufficient persistence, you'll become completely free. There is nothing else you have to do or take care of. Life takes care of itself for you. Chapter 6, The True Litmus Test The litmus test for everything I have described so far is this, observe your inner state as you go about your daily affairs. Adopt the stance of a neutral observer and just gently notice what happens on the inside without trying to influence any of it. You'll find yourself developing a sense of meta-awareness, as if you are the neutral observer of it all. You'll notice a sense of detachment and separation from your body. See your body moving through all of life and your daily affairs. Then see your thoughts accompanying you through all of life and your daily affairs. It is a surreal feeling once you adopt the neutral stance of an observer without trying to change or direct things one way or the other. While you are in that disengaged and neutral state, observe the thoughts slash feelings that spontaneously arise in your consciousness. This is the key, your consciousness should be in a zero, neutral and peaceful state as you go about your daily affairs. Notice your eyes looking at something as you normally would and then notice the judgments or thoughts that spontaneously arise within yourself as you look at that object. If no judgments or thoughts arise spontaneously within your consciousness, congratulations. You have passed the litmus test. Your consciousness is truly at the state of zero. You have reached a state in which less than 1% of the population is able to achieve that of looking at something without simultaneously also judging or labeling it. I remember how Eckhart Tolle made this point so lucidly in one of his writings, citing the example of looking at a tree and seeing what it truly is without labeling or judging it in any way. I thought he was out of his mind. What does he mean by judging or labeling a tree? Of course I know that is a tree, and of course my mind will be telling me it is a tree, what absurdity in his teachings. It took me the next decade to realize his teachings. What Eckhart Tolle, along with all the spiritual teachers, was trying to convey is this, the moment we perceive something with our physical eyes, our mind immediately goes into the habit of labeling and generating thoughts in response to the phenomenon that we observe. This is the organizing function of our personal belief system which I described in Light Touch Manifestations. What these spiritual masters were also trying to convey is that these thoughts are unnecessary. They cloud our consciousness. Realizing this is the ultimate realization. I finally understood what they said when I heard Lester Levinson teach that every thought is a limitation, every thought we think must be limited. He said this very slowly, emphasizing every single word of that statement. What he means is that our thoughts have never been part of our true nature. They have been added on to the clear lens that we have. Anything that is added on to the originally clear windscreen is superfluous. They are not part of our being and can be dropped at any time. I am not one who is interested in the theoretical discussion of these spiritual principles. Instead, I have always been an advocate of going out there and applying it for yourself. Until you can realize these teachings for yourself, they will always sound like a meaningless bunch of garbage for you. Spiritual practice is very much like learning a new language. Initially, one thinks he is listening to garbage or nonsensical sounds. Then one day, after one has gained sufficient mastery, everything makes sense. A whole new world emerges and unfolds before our eyes.
What a rich world we have previously been oblivious to, although those words have been uttered so many times right beside our ears. The same applies here. It was not until I finally experienced what Eckhart Tolle was writing about that I could link it to what Lester Levinson taught. The linking will happen for each of us in unique ways as life unfolds. Try it out for yourself. Go about your day and observe the usual phenomenon that you observe. Go shop for groceries and stand in the queue. Notice yourself looking at and observing things, perceiving the environment around you with your five senses. At the same time, become extremely aware of what is happening on the inside as you are doing the observing. How are you processing the inputs received from the outer world? Do you react to every single input with a thought or judgment? If so, drop the corresponding feelings produced by the thought immediately. This is the true meaning of developing a moment-by-moment -moment awareness, and maintaining an inner state of peace. If no thoughts arise spontaneously within you, congratulations. You have taken these teachings to heart and have practiced them diligently. Here are some of the thoughts that can arise within our consciousness as we go about our day, oh what a pretty lady. I would like that item. Nice cologne. Yucks I would never dress this way he must be a lawyer, or insert whatever label here, I can't wait to get out of this bus. All of these self-talk forms much of our mind chatter. Each of the preceding statements, and I'm sure you can come up with many more, leads to corresponding feelings some of which go on to affect our outer reality. A number of them have no effect because some of these statements slash feelings slash intentions cancel each other out, but you get the idea. If the feelings produced by these inner statements are left unchecked, you can very easily run yourself into a bad mood without knowing why. When you go about your day with zero mind chatter, just observing the phenomenon around you with absolutely no corresponding judgments and thoughts, you would have reached an important milestone. It would be a turning point in your life. It is a surreal feeling to go through your day at zero, along with a moment-to-moment -moment awareness that you are indeed, at zero. But no amount of words and descriptions will do this state justice. You have to experience it for yourself. It is my highest intention that all of my readers get to experience this state for themselves at some point. The great Lebanese-American poet Khalil Gibran wrote, You talk when you cease to be at peace with your thoughts. If peace is that zero state within ourselves, then any of our judgmental-slash-negative thoughts will stand in jarring contrast to that peace. Therefore any time that peace within ourselves is broken, we have a tendency to react and respond accordingly in the outer world by taking some sort of a compensatory action. We feel the need to judge and gossip about others when we cannot stand our own thoughts about that person. We feel a need to take drastic action to achieve our goals when our thoughts about lack shatter that peace within. What this also means is that if your inner state is one centered on love and peace, then there is absolutely nothing you have to do. There is absolutely nothing you need to do. This was the central tenet of my other book, Dollars Flow to Me Easily as it relates to the manifestation of financial wealth in our lives. It also relates to the manifestation paradox, a related concept which I have written about in a book of the same name. When we are at an inner state of love and peace, we will not perceive a need to change anything on the outside. Everything will be complete, whole, and perfect to us. Everything will be just where it needs to be, at the level it needs to be. We will just be. We will just bask in the pure gloriousness of it all without needing anything to be different. The very need to change something or for something to be different produces superfluous and extraneous thoughts within our consciousness. Those thoughts go on to produce feelings that cloud our consciousness. Therefore, if such thoughts arise within you, along with corresponding feelings of worry slash lack slash negativity, Gently let the feelings go at once and restore your inner state back to one of love and peace. I continually emphasize that this is the only work you ever need to do. If you will do this part of the equation, the universe will handle the rest. 
This zero state is a state of pure love. It is a state in which the spiritual masters are in. When there is nothing left in your consciousness, then there is nothing but love because love is the true nature of your being. However, do not be discouraged if you cannot maintain or be in this state for a sustained period of time. You will get there with practice. Besides, if you cultivate the mental habit of having a moment-by-moment -moment awareness and dropping any negative feelings that are there, then you will continually get yourself back to zero. In other words, if you clean your windscreen each time you notice it is dirty, then you will have a clean windscreen most of the time, and that is enough. However, if you blame yourself for having a dirty windscreen as you go through life, then guess what? that blame is going to produce more feelings that will cloud your inner consciousness. Do you see how this is a catch-22 situation for most people? Any form of negativity or disappointment in themselves results in extraneous slash unnecessary feelings that move them further away from the zero state that they are trying to achieve. Therefore, they are actually heaping dirt on their windscreens in an effort to clean it. Any thought in itself produces corresponding feelings that cloud your consciousness. Let all of those self-critical thoughts, feelings, go. Have you seen one of those infomercials selling special floor mops on TV? Somehow there will always be a hilarious demonstration of how conventional mops do such a poor job at cleaning our floors. One wonders after watching how we could have lived with our old mops for so long. Take a look at how the marketers do it. It can be quite entertaining. Each cleaning motion made by a conventional mop makes the mess worse. The dirt and grime is dragged across the whole floor instead of picked up by the fabric. Then the zealous demonstrator goes on to add more ketchup and sauce to the already dirty floor. You get the idea. What we want to do is to lift that dirt off without adding more of it or spreading it all around. You want to lift it off cleanly and be done with it. Most people are using that conventional mop when it comes to dropping negative feelings from their inner state. They are engaging in those feelings, rationalizing them and entertaining them with more thoughts. That's like pouring more soda or ketchup on an already soiled floor and trying to clean all of it up. I am not going to pretend that all of this change will happen overnight. Chances are that when you observe your inner state, you'll notice all sorts of spontaneous thoughts and judgments that arise. But you now know the simple way of dealing with them instead of dragging all that dirt around just gently let them go. That's it. Lift the dirt up and be done with it. Do it consistently enough and you will have a clean windscreen most of the time, for longer and longer periods. This will come true faster for some of you than others especially those who have been reading my other books and going the inner work for some time. But you have to do the inner work by yourself and no one can do it for you. That's because no one has the ability to intend and create on your behalf. Chapter 7, Spontaneous Manifestations are part of your nature. Here is an experiment which you can try while in this totally non-judgmental and non-resistant state of love. I recommend trying this only after you have been in the zero state for some time, i.e. a few weeks or months. If reading about this experiment brings up feelings of self-doubt for you, then I recommend putting this off to a later time when you are ready for it. Thoughts and corresponding feelings of self-doubt can only cloud your perception and move you away from that manifestative state of zero which you want to remain in. Let us revisit the windscreen analogy again. When you are in a state of zero with a totally clear windscreen, you have a perfect and undistorted view of reality. You see reality the way the universe sees it where everything is clear, whole, and pristine. But that's where the similarities between these manifestation principles and the windscreen analogy ends. In the windscreen analogy, your perception of outer reality only happens in one direction, from the outside in. In other words, the clear windscreen allows you to accurately perceive whatever is happening around you on the outside. In our manifestation universe however, things get even better and weirder. Not only does a clear windscreen allow you to have an accurate perspective of reality, 
from the outside in, it also allows the universe to accurately pick up on any intentions and thoughts which you are holding on the inside, from the inside out. Therefore, any communication with the universe is bidirectional. It occurs simultaneously in both directions not only from the universe to you, but also from you to the universe at all times. This latter knowledge is key to your outer manifestations. Now you can understand what is really happening here. When our inner states are clouded with negative thoughts of worry, fear, and disappointment, two things happen as a result. First, we no longer perceive things as the universe sees them and we feel an acute need to control slash change things. This results in more unwanted thoughts and feelings, which in turn clouds our perception more, leading to a downward spiral. We stew in the soup of negative emotions on the inside. Second, because our inner state is so tainted by our negative thoughts and feelings, any deliberate intentions which we hold are not purely picked up upon by the universe. The universe is picking up on our original intention which is also simultaneously tainted with all our negative unwanted thoughts, resulting in no outer manifestations. This is why maintaining a blank canvas, or zero state, for most of your waking moments is so important. Having a moment-by-moment -moment awareness of how your inner state looks like on the inside ensures that your deliberate intentions are not mixed with any contradictory vibrations. When an individual is in a state of zero, any deliberate intention which he holds in his consciousness stands out very clearly. This means that the universe picks up on it purely and as a result, this intention becomes manifest in his outer reality extremely quickly. The experiment which I alluded to at the beginning of the chapter goes like this, hold a deliberate intention while being in a state of zero and peace. Be sure to hold that intention purely without also generating any corresponding feelings of self-doubt, worry, fear or judgment. Recall that any of these extraneous thoughts slash feelings is like adding more dirt onto the surface. Just hold your original intention purely and let it stand in stark contrast to the zero state which already exists in the background. What happens next can only be described as miraculous to the uninitiated, if an intention is held purely enough in one's consciousness without the use of any force or attachment to the outcome, then a corresponding outer manifestation has to happen quickly without any outer directed effort required. The holding of that pure intention on the inside is all that is necessary to make things happen on the outside. How is this even possible? How is it possible to make something happen in our outer world without taking any physical action on our part? You'll realize that it has always been possible once you understand the quantum nature of our universe in which physical time and space pose no barriers. Our universe does not need to communicate through physical words or actions in order to make things happen. Universal impulses can be picked up perfectly by you no matter where you are physically located, just as an intention held on the inside can be picked up perfectly by the universe and acted upon at any time. The key to this little experiment is that the intention has to be held purely on the inside with no associated interfering thoughts. Any thoughts that intrude into your consciousness during this period, of worry, self-doubt, wanting to control how things will turn out slash any kind of attachment to the outcome, will also be picked up by the universe and acted upon, leading to a delay in your outer manifestations. Hence the age-old adage is true, worrying about when something will come delays it even more because the universe is always picking up on your true feelings and giving back to you the physical version of them. This is the whole art of manifestation summarized in a single sentence. The most valuable thing you can learn to do is to work harmoniously with these universal principles instead of unknowingly working against them in your daily life. A paradox arises once you encounter these teachings. If everything is perfect, whole, and complete from our perspective once we have a clear inner state, then what do we have left to ask for? Won't we have no desires at all? Won't all our desires just fade away into the background? The answer to each of these questions is a yes. Anyone who has restored their inner state to one of zero experiences a state of zero desires, 
in which there is a conspicuous absence of thoughts related to wanting to control the outcome in any way. We become all right if physical manifestations occur for us, but also all right if our manifestations do not occur. We have given up all attachments to the outcome. This is a state of absence of our desires where we just let things be the way they are. One common misconception about this desireless state is that nothing will happen for us since we are asking for nothing. This cannot be further from the truth. In fact, the opposite is true. Everything will now happen for you since you are no longer actively pushing things away with your negative thoughts. You are freeing the way for everything you have asked for to come into your physical experience and it will be an exhilarating ride for you. You'll experience the spontaneous fulfillment and manifestation of your desires with none of the downsides from dealing with those negative thoughts. You will not waste any of your energy on those negative feelings which are not needed for the fulfillment of your intentions. There is a difference between having an intention and having a desire. When we hold an intention, we identify with something which we would like to bring into being. An intention is a thought held in our consciousness of something. For example, one can hold an intention for abundance, and in the process of holding that intention, become abundance. This intention for abundance is different from having a desire to achieve abundance, although both usually occur at the same time. This is the reason why we might find it difficult to disentangle what our pure intentions feel like from what our desires feel like. We have been conditioned to think of them as one and the same. The dictionary definition of both words provides a good starting point for our understanding. An intention is defined as an anticipated outcome that is intended or that guides your planned action. A desire is defined as the feeling that accompanies an unsatisfied state, the inclination to want things. Feel the difference in the vibrational essence of these two words. An intention does not have any feeling of lack in it. It is whole and complete by itself. On the other hand, a desire implies lack. A desire is not whole and complete by itself. It only exists in relation to a lack of something. A desire arises because of a perceived lack of the very thing which you are asking for. This is also why desires gently fade away when you reach that zero state. Without any corresponding perceived lack, there can be no desires but there can still be intentions. When you intend something, you use that intention to guide your course of actions. Your intentions move you in a particular direction. Holding an intention for abundance moves you in the direction of abundance. Whenever we hold an intention for something, we become part of that broader intention. In this case, we become abundance. In my book Afternoon Manifestations, I discussed the significance of the I Am teachings which are especially relevant here. When one says I am abundant, they become the essence of what they ask for in consciousness. There is no perceived lack, shortage, physical disparity, or the need to attract anything from the outside in order to fulfill that intention. They simply become one with what they hold in their consciousness. On the other hand, when one desires something, he first has to identify with the lack or absence of that thing, which is why he then develops a want for it to make up for that lack. Feel the difference between these two states on the inside. Contrary to popular belief, it is possible to move through life without having any desires. I gained this insight from Dr. David Hawkins, a spiritual explorer who wrote several books during his lifetime that sparked countless controversies and debates. What I found most useful from his numerous works was his personal recounting of his spiritual journey. What Dr. Hawkins wrote in his book Letting Go left a deep impression on me. He taught that our manifestations happen in spite of our desires, not because of them. We, our egos, think that our desires are what made those manifestations happen in the first place, not realizing that they would have happened anyway without our desires and without our active intervention. All we need to do is to tend to our inner states and restore it to one of love and peace. The universe will come in and do the rest for us. 
I hope you now have a deeper appreciation of why manifestations are about letting go on the inside rather than the active solicitation and pursuance of goals slash material things from the outside. The former view is in line with the highest spiritual truths while the latter is driven by our action-oriented culture and a less than complete understanding of these universal laws. Thankfully, we all have to start from somewhere so give thanks that you are on this path. Give thanks that you are moving in the right direction. All the spiritual masters I have studied started off by holding on strongly to the latter view, before realizing the futility and foolishness of it all when they recognized the true nature of the universe. The faster you make the switch, the sooner you will be free from the everyday problems that plague the majority of the population. As Lester Levinson used to say, life becomes very comfortable for you after that. It is with this understanding that you can fully apply the process which the universe shared with me. I call it the infinite release process. As the name suggests, the infinite release process is used for dropping anything that is not in harmony with your highest good. Without the foundation laid by the earlier half of this book, one would not readily appreciate the importance of letting go. Hence, had I shared this process right at the start of this book, I would have undoubtedly lost many readers who would still insist on their old action-oriented way of operating in the world. Now that you have a deeper understanding of the structure of the universe, the finer points of the process will become more obvious and applicable for you. With that, let's begin the next phase of our exploration. Chapter 8, The Magic of Infinite Release A conscious intention, when held with a light touch, moves us in the direction of that intention. This happens in accordance with universal laws. The moment we ask and hold an intention for something, that impulse is picked up by the universe, provided we have a peaceful and conducive inner state that is unclouded by negative thoughts. This impulse is also immediately answered in energetic form, which means that universal energy rearranges itself according to what we have asked for. The very first signs that something is happening will be our changed feelings about a situation on the inside. We usually feel as if a tipping point has been reached regarding the situation. Things just click into place within us. At that point, no outer confirmation is necessary. Despite the absence of physical evidence, we just know in our heart of hearts that it is a done deal. Not in the future but right now, in this very moment. We know with every fiber of our being that the physical manifestation is inevitable. What remains is watching the manifestation unfold with a great sense of curiosity and joy. The best analogy I can give for this assured yet curious inner state is this. Try to find a similar feeling from your own life experience. Have you ever been through an experience where you just knew you would eventually achieve your goal? and that everything was just a step you had to take in order to reach that goal? Studying for my college degree was one such experience for me. I knew right from my first day in college that I was going to graduate with a degree four years down the road. The moment I started, I knew the degree was a done deal, and so it was. Yes, I still had to physically go through the journey of fulfilling my course requirements, but to me on the inside, it was done. Everything just felt like a natural unfolding of the process for me. I took each step along the way with great delight and anticipation. When I compare this with a few of the manifestations I struggled with for a long time, a different pattern emerges. Instead of the same sense of inner knowing and natural ease, I was confronted with self-doubt and worries along the way. To me on the inside, it was far from a done deal. In fact, it felt like an uncertain outcome to me, and I often wondered whether the physical manifestations would eventually happen. These negative thoughts contradict the original intention and delay our outer manifestations. The whole secret to manifestations then, is to let these thoughts go by restoring our inner state to one of love, assurance, and peace. If we remain long enough in an assured and peaceful state, what we ask for will show up in our reality very quickly, sometimes within a matter of minutes, hours, or days. 
The ways through which your physical manifestations can come true for you will surprise and delight you. Often, these will be ways completely beyond your wildest expectations and yet brilliantly executed such that they are more than just mere coincidences. In turn, how long reality takes to shift on the outside depends on how clear your inner state is on the inside. The beauty of the creative process is that you never have to concern yourself with the specifics of what you are asking for. This is extremely powerful. You can ask for something without knowing how you will get it, and it will still find its way to you if you maintain an inner state that is compatible with your intention. This is what the spiritual masters mean when they say you never have to figure out how to make something happen for you. That is the job of the universe. If you will accept that figuring out the how is the universe's role, then you free yourself from all of the unnecessary emotional burden. Much of our worries over our manifestations stem from how something is going to happen for us. We spend all of our time obsessed with the hows, not realizing that it has never been our job in the first place. All of these petty worries and concerns become blocks slash resistances in the manifestation process. When you have a worrying thought about how something will manifest for you, you taint that clear windscreen of yours with ongoing worrisome thoughts, extending our analogy further, with a torrent of bird droppings. How can you see clearly enough to get to your intended destination with your windscreen bombarded with fresh bird droppings every second? These associated worrisome thoughts are impeding your journey by obscuring the way, no matter what good intentions you hold. If you are not fully conscious and aware that these worrisome thoughts are there, you will continue to ask very hard for your original intention while wondering why it does not show up. Of course it does not show up. All these unrestrained negative thoughts are contradicting the vibrations sent out by your original intention. What the universe showed me was that our intentions are an extremely powerful manifestation tool. If intentions can spark off a whole series of energetic events and eventual physical manifestations, then our intentions can also be used in another way to aid us in our manifestations. This is the infinite release process which the universe shared with me. Recall that any intention, when held purely enough with a light touch, produces a corresponding outer manifestation in our physical reality. We can therefore set an overriding slash overarching intention not only for what we want, but also to release any feelings or blockages that impede or delay what we are consciously asking for. In other words, we can set broader intentions to drop all the unconscious beliefs slash blocks slash negative feelings that we may have unknowingly set up for ourselves along the way. This is an extremely powerful method to clear the path for our desired manifestations. The gist of the process is as follows, first, we identify a recurring block that has been preventing us from having a peaceful inner state. Recall from our manifestation sequence that the cause of any recurring thought slash feeling is always the memories slash beliefs held in our unconscious. 1. Unconscious memories slash beliefs equals equals, 2. Conscious thoughts equals equals, 3. Feelings and emotions in our inner state equals equals, 4. Physical manifestations in our outer world. Let's suppose that try as you might, you find it difficult to forgive a particular person for what he slash she has done to you in the past. Angry thoughts about this person constantly surface in your consciousness as, 2. Conscious thoughts, leading to, 3. Frequent unhappy feelings and emotions in your inner state. What I would first do is to follow the letting go process taught in my earlier books, Light Touch Manifestations and Afternoon Manifestations, to consciously let any feelings of anger and resentment go. Recall that when dealing with these issues, it may be necessary to go through several hundred rounds of any release process until you are completely free from negative feelings in the current moment. Let's also suppose that after going through several hundred rounds of releasing, these feelings still come up for you from time to time. What you can then do, an insight which the universe showed me, is that you can set an intention to let these inner blocks go, along with all the unconscious memories slash beliefs that are causing it. In addition to holding an intention to let the inner blocks go, 
you can also intend that the process be done continuously for an infinite number of times. This is where the infinite in the infinite release process comes in. When you set an intention for the release to be done an infinite number of times, you set off a sequence of energetic events that are done without your conscious intervention. Therefore, an infinite release intention consists of three parts. 1. The intention to drop a particular block slash resistance that is holding you back. 2. An intention to carry out the releasing process above for an infinite number of times until your inner state is restored to one of love and peace. 3. An intention for your inner state to remain at zero. These three parts of the infinite release process work together to reinforce each other, leading to exponentially powerful and permanent results on the outside. The first intention signifies your willingness to let go of any negative contradictory blocks slash beliefs that are holding you back. The second intention instructs your higher self to release as many times as necessary until your inner state is restored to one of love and peace in the current moment. The third acknowledges the possibility that we may unknowingly pick up new resistant thoughts slash beliefs as we go through life and therefore an intention is set for our inner state to remain at zero, by releasing any negative feelings when necessary. These three intentions collectively form an infinite loop. What the universe showed me was that on top of continuously and manually releasing on the inside, we can also invoke this process and have the universe do it for us. But you must first set an intention for that to happen. The universe cannot choose on your behalf. Chapter 9, The Basic Infinite Release Process This is how to invoke the basic infinite release process. Take a few deep breaths, relaxing as you breathe out slowly. Close your eyes and check in on your inner state. Notice the feelings that are there without labeling or influencing them in any way. Gently let each feeling in your inner state go by following the letting go process as described in Light Touch Manifestations. Do not proceed to the next step until your inner state is completely clear and at zero. While you are at zero and feeling completely at peace and serene, gently state the following intention by speaking these words silently to yourself. I now release slash drop slash let go of, insert issue slash block here, for an infinite number of times until zero. I release this underscore 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 infinitely for as many times as necessary, until I remain at zero. Note that you can change the words to your liking so long as you retain their overall meaning. The universe picks up on our innermost feelings and not on our mere physical words. In the case of dealing with forgiveness issues, the intention statement that can be used is, I now release all blocks preventing me from forgiving John for an infinite number of times until zero. I release these blocks infinitely, for as many times as necessary, until I remain at zero. After you have stated your intention, feel this intention in your being. The intention should stand out powerfully for you, in stark contrast to the pure inner state that forms the backdrop. Feel the feeling, intentionality, of those words in your being, then open your eyes and go about your daily activities. No further actions are necessary on your part. Remember that we are not trying to make anything happen when invoking an infinite release intention. All we are trying to do is to drop any elements that are disharmonious with our highest good. We are letting go of all unwanted beliefs and memories, rather than trying to attract something from out there into our lives. Here is another example on how to phrase the intention statement this time for an individual who constantly worries about whether a particular physical manifestation will come true for him, I now release all worries over whether I will manifest my dream home for an infinite number of times until I reach zero. I release for infinite times until I remain at zero. In the infinite release process, you first set an intention to release the block slash resistance to your manifestation before setting an intention to repeat the earlier intention infinite times until the resistance is completely dropped. You also hold a third intention to remain at that zero state, such that any new resistance is immediately erased. Therefore you are really setting three intentions, 
an intention to drop something undesired from your consciousness, a second follow-up intention that your first intention is repeated an infinite number of times, and a third intention that the process is repeated whenever necessary. These three intentions set off an infinite loop that clears any beliefs slash memories which sabotage your physical manifestations. The infinite release process is profound because it ties in with the universal laws we have discussed up to this point. Recall that figuring out the hows is never your job. It is always the universe's role. Your job is to decide what you want and hold on to that vision purely in your mind. Therefore, all you need to do is to hold any intention with a light touch and the universe will make it happen for you in the most harmonious way possible. In a similar vein, all you have to do is to hold an intention that all your negative, contradictory resistances be dropped, and the universe will drop them for you, just like that. You don't even have to worry about how the universe is going to drop them or whether you can drop them. All you do is to intend to drop them. In the moment you intend something, it is so. The second ingenuity of the infinite release process, which I could never have figured out on my own, is the clever stacking of intentions, one on top of the other. Once we set an initial intention to let any unconscious blocks go, we then set a second intention to repeat the first intention for an infinite number of times. This greatly compounds the effectiveness of the releasing process. While we may only be able to physically go through the releasing process a few hundred or even a few thousand times on our own in a single sitting, enlisting the universe's help in this process compounds its effectiveness. You are now able to release an infinite number of times until everything is restored to zero. Once again, you do not have to worry about how this will be done. All you have to do is to set a deliberate intention for it, and it is so. The final part of the infinite release process is for you to remain at that zero state. Abraham Hicks frequently teach that we unknowingly pick up resistances along our physical trail. This means that as we go through life, we sometimes pick up negative thought patterns and beliefs that may go on to affect our outer manifestations. These resistances accumulate as stresses, pains, and weaknesses in our emotional and physical body if not released. Some of our beliefs further reinforce these weaknesses within our body. For example, if you believe that exposure to chemicals slash additives is harmful to your body, then such exposure will have cumulative weakening effects. Thus, there is a need to repeat the releasing process on an ongoing basis each time these unconscious resistances are picked up. When you release any resistance spontaneously within yourself, you are free from their long-term deleterious effects once and for all. Chapter 10 Adapting the Basic Recipe for Advanced Manifestations What I described in the previous chapter was the basic recipe which you can use to construct your own infinite release intention statements. Recall that there are three parts to an infinite release intention, 1, the intention to let go of the block, 2, the intention to let go an infinite number of times until we reach that zero state, and, 3, the intention to release spontaneously so that we remain at zero no matter what happens. The infinite release process works well with addictions, negative feelings, recurring behaviors, unwanted habits, and any form of resistance which you have identified. Different individuals will have different forms of resistance which stand in the way of their physical manifestations, so adapt the basic recipe to your own situation. For starters, I recommend that you apply the infinite release process to recurring blocks associated with your physical manifestations. Let's suppose that you have set an intention for a new car to come into your life. You have followed the manual letting go process and let go of much of your self-doubts and worries about how the car is going to materialize for you but still find yourself plagued with occasional worries over the finances, how you are going to afford it. This represents a block, a sticking point, for you in your manifestation of that car. Note that this block is a perceived limitation that exists only in your consciousness and is of absolutely no concern to the universe. The universe has no trouble getting that car to you if only you'll allow it and clear the way for it. Therefore, 
the limitation you have to deal with is on the inside. The need to change anything on the outside is only an illusion. As long as this limitation exists within you, negative thoughts and feelings will cloud your inner state and affect the eventual physical manifestation. The infinite release process helps by effectively dissolving this block on the inside and restoring your inner state to one of love and peace. This is a manifestative state which allows all the good you have asked for to come into your life. It is not a process to make things happen or to attract something from the outside. When you get clear on the inside, physical manifestations have to occur for you on the outside. The infinite release statement in this case can be, I now release all worries over whether I can afford a Mercedes-Benz S500, or insert any other item you desire, for an infinite number of times until I remain at zero. I release this worry infinitely, as many times as necessary, until I remain at zero. You repeat this infinite release process for each negative block identified. Individuals often have trouble trusting the manifestation process. The beauty of the infinite release process is that it can be applied to these specific issues of faith and trust as well. I now release all worries over how my Mercedes-Benz S500 is going to come into my life for an infinite number of times until I reach zero. I release these worries infinitely, for as many times as necessary, until I stay at zero. Notice how I have tweaked the phrasing of the intention statement to suit each case. The phrasing is flexible and not cast in stone. Use words that come to you spontaneously which best describe your feelings. The universe will show you the right words to use. Sometimes we are afraid that our physical manifestations will not happen for us. This gives rise to a deep belief in lack and a corresponding fervent desire in our lives to get what we want at all costs. I have already explained how our desires keep us apart from our manifestations. Therefore, the infinite release statement that can be used is, I now release all fears that my Mercedes-Benz S500 is not going to manifest in my life for an infinite number of times until I reach zero. I now release all fears that my manifestations will not happen. I release this and other related fears infinitely, for as many times as necessary, until I remain at zero. Try the infinite release process on everything. Try it with an open mind you'll realize that this powerful technique dissolves any perceived blocks that stand in your way. When you invoke the infinite release process, you let go and let God. You no longer dictate that things have to come through a certain path or by a certain time. Instead, you remove all these self-imposed limitations and free the way for your highest good to enter your life. Attachment to the outcome Wanting things to be one way or the other, is another common stumbling block when it comes to our physical manifestations. The infinite release process works excellently in these cases too, I now release all my attachments related to the manifestation of the Mercedes-Benz S500 in my life for an infinite number of times until I reach zero. I let everything that happens be alright. I release my attachment infinite times as needed until I remain at zero. There you have it, various ways to adapt the basic three-step infinite release process to specific cases. Try it with an open mind without any preconceived notions or expectations. Our intentions work best when we hold them with a light touch and free ourselves from any expectations. Oh yes, the infinite release technique can free us from our own expectations as well. Now you can understand why this technique is so infinitely powerful. To let go of the expectations you have set up for yourself, I now release all my expectations related to the manifestation of the Mercedes-Benz S500 in my life for an infinite number of times until I reach zero. I drop all my expectations for an infinite number of times until I remain at zero. To let go of any impatient feelings surrounding the manifestation, I now release all my impatience related to the manifestation of the Mercedes-Benz S500 in my life for an infinite number of times until I reach zero. I let all my impatience go as it comes up, for an infinite number of times until I remain at zero. 
to let go of your desire to rush through and apply this technique all at once, I now release my desire to rush through this process slash technique slash book for an infinite number of times until I reach zero. I let all that urgency slash rushed feeling go as it comes up, for an infinite number of times until I remain at zero. Experiment with the infinite release process in your own life. Treat it with proper respect and only ask for things which you really want instead of applying it frivolously to your trivial desires and demands. This does not mean that you should not ask for what you want. Rather, you should only use the process for your true desires. For example, I have used the Mercedes S500 automobile as a placeholder for all our possible intentions. It is all right to follow my exact phrasing to ask for that car if it is indeed what you want. But you should not set an intention just to test the system and see if this works, let me just use it and see if I can get my Mercedes anyway. Any thoughts slash feelings about the need to approve something to yourself will move you further away from your intended zero state. The good news is that you can use the infinite release process to dissolve these feelings as well. I now release any need to test or prove the process to myself for an infinite number of times until I reach zero. I let go of my need for proof as it comes up, for an infinite number of times until I remain at zero. Chapter 11, On the Spot Release and Relief One crucial element of the infinite release process is that it has to be done with a calm and peaceful inner state. You cannot invoke the infinite release process with an inner state that is cluttered with worry and fear thoughts, simply because your intention will be crowded out by all the simultaneous negative intentions held in the moment. As such, always ensure that you are in a state of total calm and poise before starting the infinite release process. As you become more proficient with the process, you will find that there is no need to close your eyes in order to get into that peaceful zero state. You can do it just as easily with your eyes open, simply by noticing any extraneous feelings that are there and by letting them go in the moment. The more you practice, the more you'll realize that there is no need to go through the three questions each time you want to let go of a particular feeling. Sometimes, just being aware of the presence of a feeling reminds you that you can let it go, just like that. You can use the infinite release process as you go through your daily affairs for on-the-spot release and relief. For this purpose, I use a shortened version of the infinite release intention statement which goes like this, I let go of underscore 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 infinite times down to zero. I let go of underscore 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 infinite times so that I remain at zero. This shortened intention statement is very powerful in situations where you do not have the opportunity to close your eyes and use the long-form version. Let's suppose that you are going about your daily affairs when a sudden sense of fear over your financial affairs grips you. You find your mind wandering off in the direction of those unwanted thoughts. Become especially aware of the corresponding unwanted feelings in the moment and center yourself. No matter where you are in that moment, feel the stillness and peace within you. Get in touch with a little piece of this inner peace. It is always there no matter where you are or what you are doing. Just feel whatever peace that is there. After you have connected with your inner peace, silently repeat the infinite release intention statement to yourself, I let go of this financial worry infinite times down to zero. I let go of these financial worries infinite times so that I remain at zero. Get in touch, feel, that inner peace within yourself again after you have affirmed the statement and resume your activities. The mere intention that you have set will be picked up and acted upon by the universe, without the need for your conscious or active intervention. The infinite release intention statement not only eliminates emotional feelings and distress. It can also be used on physical ailments and pains. While the subject of physical ailments slash pains is beyond the scope of this book, this is an opportune time to introduce how the process can be applied in this manner. Immediately after an injury or during an episode of physical pain, get in touch with your inner peace and lightly intend, the universe now heals slash reduces the cause of this pain infinite. Times down to zero. 
The healing is repeated infinite times until I remain at zero. I have substituted I for the universe in the above example because it can sometimes be difficult to remain neutral when confronted with physical symptoms. However, as with all of this infinite release work, it is universal intelligence that does the required clearing for us and not our logical, rational selves. If our own logical selves could have dropped these issues, we would have done so long ago on our own. The infinite release sequence takes our reasoning selves out of the picture by completely dropping any mind chatter or extraneous thoughts. That is when the universe is free to step in and work its magic. How would one feel immediately after using the infinite release process? As with any energetic inner work, different individuals experience the process differently in line with how they perceive energy. For me, I feel a light buzz immediately after I intend. This buzz is difficult to describe in words, but it feels as though I have a clearer perception of my physical reality through my senses. Colors become more vibrant and things around me become brighter. I seem to perceive more of reality. This is a direct consequence of the infinite release process, since its main function is to help us drop any extraneous thoughts slash feelings slash beliefs that unknowingly cloud our perception. Chapter 12, The Power of Stopping at Nothing What does an inner state for infinite manifestations feel like? Now that you have gone through this book, you will be able to answer this question from your own personal experience because you would have experienced this state several times for yourself. The inner state conducive for endless, infinite manifestations is one where you are continuously centered on nothingness and pure beingness. It is a state marked by the conspicuous absence of intrusive thoughts and feelings. It is a state in which you know that all is well and that nothing needs to be changed. A state where you are all right with whatever that happens to you, and know deeply that whatever happens is always in your highest good. It is a non-resistant state where you gently observe everything that unfolds through you with a sense of curiosity and wide-eyed amazement. It is a manifestative state of being as opposed to thinking. Infinite manifestations are already unfolding in your life whether you realize it or not. Life is a series of ongoing manifestations and creative moments. But when your inner state is clouded with worries and fears, your spontaneous manifestations on the outside will largely be undesired. Once you develop a moment-to-moment -moment awareness of your inner state and actively release anything that is not in harmony with your highest intentions, you clear the path for your highest good to come into your life. This highest good comes in the form of spontaneous manifestations that will surprise and delight you from moment to moment. You are now swept along by the universal flow instead of struggling against it. Manifestations are not about attracting things from somewhere out there into your life. It is not about figuring out how you will get something. Leave all of that mind chatter and figuring out to the universe. Your job is to decide what you want, and then hold on to a pure intention of that which you want. Your pure intention, when held against the calm backdrop of a peaceful inner state, becomes manifest in your outer reality quickly, often in a matter of hours or days. Realize this for yourself. You'll find this effortless way of living to be your natural state. No more struggling through life to figure things out and solve one problem after another, but just a sense of comfortable, ongoing ease moving from one high point to another. Universal intelligence is always standing by, ready to intervene and guide us along at any moment. In the instant that you ask for something, no matter how big or small it is, universal intelligence picks it up and energetic forces respond accordingly. So why not put these universal forces to good use? Use these spiritual principles to clear any negative unconscious beliefs and memories that may be holding your manifestations back through the infinite release process. When you invoke this process, you enlist the help of universal intelligence to clear the root cause, the unconscious memories slash blocks slash beliefs, of your delayed or unwanted manifestations. You signify your willingness to move past and beyond the blocks which may have tripped you up in the past. 
The infinite release process does not depend on your level of belief, but on your willingness to give the process a try. When one continues to argue for their limitations and why they cannot have something, these limitations invariably come true for them and become part of their ongoing reality. The moment one expresses their willingness to drop these self-imposed limitations for the truth, then the universe steps in with all the good you can possibly ask for. Life becomes comfortable without having to tend to the smallest details. The universe knows and delivers your highest good. Infinite intelligence knows no time and space limitations. Whenever you intend, it is done. When you invoke the infinite release process, you are not petitioning the universe. Neither are you praying or asking for something to come to you. All you are doing is working on clearing the limitations within yourself. Over time, you may have picked up physical resistance and unresourceful beliefs along the way. These may have caused you to revert to certain forms of thinking or acting in the world, but an application of the infinite release process sets you free. The infinite release process is a gentle method to release disharmonious beliefs and ensure that they will never recur in our consciousness. When you evoke the infinite release sequence, know that it is done even without your active intervention. Your continued attention and focus is not needed. Just let all of that go. There is nothing else you have to do. You have set a powerful releasing sequence in motion through the energetic focus of your intentions in line with these universal laws. Perhaps you have been using these universal laws previously to your disadvantage as an unconscious creator. Now that you are aware, you can call upon the creative process in a conscious and deliberate manner. Never again will you be at the mercy of your unconscious thoughts and beliefs. From now on, you become a conscious creator with full moment-to-moment -moment awareness of your creative potential. I am excited by what life holds for you from this moment on. If you have followed the steps in this book and taken the first steps towards doing the inner work, you would have done what less than 5% of our population ever bother to do. You would have made more spiritual progress than what some people achieve in several lifetimes. I say this not with a sense of superiority, but from knowing what is possible once we allow ourselves to remove all self-imposed limitations. This state is possible for everyone. I congratulate you for embarking on this journey and on moving in this new direction. In closing this book, the universe just gave me another infinite release intention statement to use. I love how freely inspiration comes to us when we get clear. Remember to infinitely release and stop at nothing. I now infinitely release until I reach zero and remain at zero, and it is so.